Hello, Meryl. Thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional background? Yeah, so I am a sex educator, a sex counselor in training. Um, I also do embodied healing work like Reiki and yoga. I have a dance background. I used to teach preschool. <laughs> so I have kind of an eclectic um, educational background. I went to grad school for education. So, but yeah, right now I'm like mostly focusing on like sex ed counseling and um, I do work in an adult sex toy store in Chicago. So that's kind of my main, my main thing. Nice. Mm -hmm. Based on your background uh, in sex education, uh, could you tell me exactly why is sex education important? Why should we be teaching sex ed in schools? You know, I mean, there's so much, and I know you were just saying before we started recording um, how much research you've been doing. So I'm sure it's speaking to the choir here that both uh, evidentiary science and history have proven time and time again that comprehensive sex education is what we need to prevent um, un unwanted pregnancies and STIs. If you look at the rate over the course of years, looking at any time that there's a period of time when abstinence-only education is more funded than comprehensive preventative sex education, you know, the rates of, of teenage pregnancies and STIs skyrocket and it just keeps happening over and over again. So, you know, just like cold hard facts <laughs> is, is right there. And then additionally, I think, you know, the, the Me Too movement that happened is very, very loud evidence to me that sex education has been long, long overdue to be part of the mainstream conversation. Um, I got into sex education as, you know, my, my main occupation because of the Me Too movement, because I just saw this, you know, wild um, disconnect between um, folks' abilities to recognize within themselves what they actually want or need or desire and how to then communicate that to a partner. So then we have a whole host of issues ranging from misunderstanding, miscommunication, awkward dates to assault to full-on rape, right? And obviously, you know, I can't prevent anybody from raping anybody else. Um, I wish that I could. If that was a superpower, I would love to sign up for it. <laughs> but, you know, the best that I feel like I can do as a sex educator and counselor is helping folks figure out, A, what do you want? What do you feel like you need to make your body feel good, to get your needs or wants or desires met? How do you even process that and recognize that within yourself? How do you process that and recognize that within, within yourself in addition to any traumas that you might have experienced already? And then how do you communicate that to your partner? And then how do you listen to your partner and figure out how to na navigate and negotiate what their wants, needs, and desires are in relation to yours? Because they might be different. They might be the same. It might just be hard to talk about. So you know, consent and communication are um, such an important aspect of, it's mostly what I talk about, frankly, you know, lubes and sex toys and body parts are just kind of secondary, <laughs> but like, honestly, you know, consent and, and communication are sort of the focus of all of it, you know. Yeah, I really like that you brought that up because um, right now we're talking about comprehensive sex ed in terms of, I guess, trying to prevent abortions, mm -hmm. specifically by preventing unwanted pregnancy. But you bringing up uh, consent and healthy communication between sexual partners really broadens the discussion and helps us understand that we need to frame this from a bodily autonomy sense, not just in the autonomy to choose whether or not you're pregnant uh, through contraceptives, effective family planning, access to abortion as part of comprehensive health care, but also being able to have the tools to communicate your wants and desires with your partner, uh, to be able to do what you want with your body when you want for pleasure. And I think so often we see unwanted pregnancy and unwanted sex as separate, even though they are both part of that bodily autonomy 
discussion. And I think it's very important that to promote bodily autonomy for everyone, we give everyone the tools uh, to understand what they want. Now, understanding what you want and knowing about contraceptives, knowing about communication techniques uh, is all well and good, but can you talk about contraceptive access and how that might interact with contraceptive education? <laughs> um, so yeah, I just want to point out really quick to something you just said before I talk about contraceptives. Something that I don't think the anti-choice movement gets that I think anyone who's genuinely in the pro-choice movement understands is that we want, like our utopia is that every child is wanted, that every child is wanted and delighted to have in this world. And that means that every person who gave birth wanted to give birth. And that means that every person who wanted to give birth wanted to have the sexual experience that led to that child manifesting right or led to the IVF experience or whatever but hopefully they had you know a loving caring environment around them when they had that experience that ev like from literal conception to birth and beyond because obviously that's something that the anti-choice movement seems to kind of just disappear after the actual <laughs> birth happens right well childbirth is a punishment for sex but exactly and once you have a child, well, you should have closed your legs. Exactly, right? <laughs> Heaven forbid that then the child actually gets care beyond that birthing experience, let well, alone the birthing parent. That right? would require us to care about our fellow humans. And as a society, we've proven that we don't. Right, yes. We clearly have issues uh, with any kind of contraceptive, including over our faces. So <laughs> I, like what a wonderful world to imagine that everything that led to this child manifesting in this world came from pleasure and came from desire and came from wanting that child to be there, you know, from, I want to have the sexual experience with this person, or I want to go through this difficult, but necessary IVF or other such methods to get pregnant. I want to do this. This is something I've chosen. This is something my partner and I have both chosen. We're both here, we're on board. We go through that process together. It's difficult, but we're here. And now we have this kid. And wow, are we blissfully happy that we're here now. And that is that is the world that I would love to see. That every child is wanted and every experience that led to that child manifesting in this world was also wanted and desired and felt good. You know, as good as, as any of those moments can feel. Obviously, there's a whole host of emotions around that, but that is that is my ideal because there's there's too much pain and there's too much unpleasantness and discomfort even in the best of circumstances um, because access to you know trauma informed comprehensive care is very very difficult. I mean, even just finding a gynecological experience that isn't traumatizing is very difficult for a lot of people, especially if you are from an underserviced or marginalized community. If you're queer or trans or a person of color, finding comprehensive health care. Um, especially reproductive health care is incredibly challenging. Yeah. So my ideal is not just, you know, not just the experience that happens with yourself or with your partner, but also the healthcare system that you're in, having access to the things that you need access to, having a doula or a midwife or a, you know, pelvic health PT to help you through, help your body through the process that's accessible, that is trauma-informed and doesn't further traumatize you just to get this baby into the world is like the idea that I have, the ideal that I have for any birthing person. So that I just wanted to put that in there because that is, that is my pro-choice world that I fight for every day. It sounds like an amazing world. <laughs> Doesn't it? I know. It'd be a lovely. Where all children are wanted. Ugh. Seems like very basic. I know. It's also just, the, <laughs> it's also just so out of reach. Exactly. You know, exactly. It'd be great. Like, I would love it if every birthing person that I know, they're like, oh, I had an orgasm when I gave birth to my kid. It was great. I had a great time. And I'm like, I would love that if that could be like, maybe not everyone, but like, <laughs> not as abnormal as what seems to be the normal, which is more trauma. Every birthing story that I hear almost more often than not is filled with trauma. And some of it is 
a part of your body having a really intense experience, but a lot of it is unnecessary and really comes from, you know, institutionalized patriarchy, racism, um, inaccessibility, all of that fun, fun stuff. So, you know, I, I would really like for all of that, anything other than what absolutely has to happen to just not be there anymore. <laughs> But back to contraceptives. Yes, access to contraceptives is very challenging, especially for anybody who um, doesn't have a penis or is going to be playing with a penis. Pretty much the only easy to access contraceptives that you can just go and pick up from a store are condoms that you put over a penis, right? Internal condoms are incredibly difficult to come by. Where can you get internal condoms? So you can get internal condoms from your doctor usually, or other such uh, medical care providers, um, reproductive medical care providers, or the Center on Halstead in Chicago. I know they provide them for free. Most adult, even adult sex toy stores don't, don't have access to them. It's really, really hard to get access to them. So, uh, you know, we are able to some places, like I know um, Early to Bed in Chicago does have some that they're giving out for free through the center on Halstead, but it is very, very difficult to find internal condoms. It's so strange to me because looking back, I remember in college, just every event you went to, especially like sexual health events, uh, most dorms would have buckets of them. You could get condoms for free anywhere, like mm -hmm. uh, condoms that you would put over a penis. I don't think I knew that an internal condom was a thing that existed until someone mentioned it like sophomore year of college. And I still like, I, I never was offered one for free. Uh, I've never like seen them in a grocery store. Mm -hmm. They're just really not easy to access, but I guess the condoms that most people know about are just everywhere. Yeah. Dental dams are also really difficult to come by. Don't I know it. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're right. So if you are a queer person, um, if you are engaging in anything other than just penis and vagina or PNB penetrative sex, if you want to engage in any barriers that don't involve uh, over the penis condoms, it is very difficult to find dental dams. Um, it's also incredibly difficult to find uh, non-latex dental dams on top of all of that. So, you know, unfortunately, like I've had to, you know, offer to people like obviously go to an adult sex toy store, they will often have dental dams or use, you know, plastic wrap, because that is at least something you can get from a grocery store. There has been some, you know, conversation around like, don't use the microwavable plastic wrap because that is slightly porous. And then there were like newer studies that came out that said, actually, they might, it might be fine. If you're absolutely like super worried, you can just use old school, very ugly, very like annoying to unwrap from the box plastic wrap. Um, but yeah, if you want like an actual dental dam, uh, those are very, very difficult to access to outside of an adult sex toy store. So, you know, just in terms of access alone, there's a lot of preference toward sheathing a penis over any other kind of physical barrier to help with preventing pregnancy um, or even STIs. And, and then there are, you know, other things like diaphragms and things like that, which again, you can only really access through um, a reproductive healthcare provider. And since the research shows that abstinence only education does not have any effect on how old teens are when they start having sex or how many sexual partners they have, abstinence only education is usually coupled with an inability to access contraceptives. And I mean, even if you could access contraceptives, if you don't know how to use them, how is that helpful? But a lot of contraceptives uh, have age restrictions on them. And are those age restrictions at all helpful, effective? Why do you think they exist? I think it, it comes from <laughs> very puritanical ideas that, you know, you're not supposed to have sex until you're married. That isn't even really true that there, you know, that you can't get married if you're 18 or older because there are still states where you can't get married under the age of 18. I think there, so, I'm gonna have to check, but I'm gonna have to check, but I think there might be states where you can get married before you can legally access contraceptives. 
correct. I think you are correct, but yes, we will have to double check that. Um, but yes, so it's not even, it's not even like legally true. <laughs> I don't think that like you aren't going to have sex before you would potentially be having sex within a marriage situation. But I think it comes from that very old belief. And, you know, I think there is also some worry about like grooming children and, you know, there's all of that kind of stuff. I think anytime that the far right has pushed for any kind of anti-gay or anti-sex um, work or anti-pregnancy thing, they always go, but the children, right? The far right <laughs> is also the group that is totally okay with actual children getting actually married. Correct. Marriage, I don't yeah. think the left has ever tried to lower the age of marriage. No, no, I don't think so. And yet, you know, here we are with like one of the most hypocritical political parties in history, I would argue. To me, um, it's less hypocritical if you view it from a lens of just controlling. Oh, for sure. Parties, right. And not just um, people with uteruses, like controlling everybody's body. Uh shaming penis owners for wa not wanting to have sex or for wanting to or for wanting to have sex shaming uterus owners both for not having sex and for having sex and for getting pregnant and for miscarrying and for having an abortion and for having too many kids or not enough kids yeah. the the culture of shame is very present the culture of shame is very present and it all, you know, comes back to that very patriarchal, heteronormative, colonialist, racist paradigm that it's all your fault. You have to bootstrap your way out of any given situation. And if you were born into a disadvantaged position, it's your fault, right? It comes, I think, even from that like old European great chain of being thing, right? That it's like you, if you were born into this like, unpleasant situation it's up to you to bootstrap your way out of it or just like live in it and be fine with it right and you know it's it is it's all about controlling people's bodies but the problem is is that it's about controlling predominantly people's bodies who are in those disadvantaged positions right so it's really interesting that you brought up that kind of bootstrap mentality around people from historically oppressed backgrounds because uh, about half, so around 40, 49% of all people who receive abortions are at or below the poverty line, an additional 26% are uh, within a factor of two of the poverty line. So 75% of people who get abortions, three, three in every four people who get abortions is making less than $26,000 a year. Fun fact, uh, even, carrying a perfectly healthy, completely normal pregnancy to term without insurance can run you up to $30,000 uh, in costs. Uh, and that's assuming no complications. That's just regular prenatal vitamins and going to the hospital uh, to have a child. So having an extra child or even getting pregnant, especially since getting pregnant can and frequently does result in missed hours, job loss. Yes, it is illegal to uh, discriminate against a pregnant person. It is a protected disability. Uh, however, uh, much like wage theft, many things that are illegal are also common practice. Uh, so just like wage theft and tip theft, firing pregnant people is very common. So a person who becomes pregnant, likely because they didn't have insurance, uh, because they couldn't afford it and couldn't afford contraceptives, then gets pregnant. And if they can't afford or access an abortion, which most of them can't, even currently, while it is legal, you get unwanted pregnancies that even if they decide they want the child, even if, like, it's a happy situation. It does trap people in debt that they were not prepared for. And it, it is a way of trapping people in poverty. Um, Correct. And I do think that uh, the moral argument often gets lost because we're so worried about like quote unquote potential lives, uh, which 
isn't a scientific term. Uh, we don't realize what trapping people in a cycle of poverty does. Like child homelessness in America is obscenely high. Children in America are starving, uh, only eating at school through assisted lunch programs and not eating over the weekends. Uh, I remember in college, uh, I did some fundraising for an organization uh, dedicated to helping children who couldn't afford to eat outside of school get food for the weekends so that they could eat on the weekends. We as a society are really, really bad and don't seem to care about protecting actual human children. So I guess to me at least, uh, the forced childbirth argument seems to be a whole lot less about like protecting children or potential children and a whole lot more about just restricting bodily autonomy and trapping people in poverty. Correct. Yes. I was really hoping you were going to reassure me that it wasn't that bad and that I just <laughs> <laughs> that I was just in a doom spiral but you're like nope it's terrible. I'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm very sorry and I, I do feel like um I do feel like my job predominantly is harm reduction I do feel like as a sex educator I've already come in too late to a lot of people's lives and this includes children this includes um when I've done sex ed for kids um, I have had students who have already been sexually assaulted, you know, um, as, as children. So, you know, the fact that, uh, again, that far right argument that, oh, they're too young to get sex education. They're too young to understand any of these things. No, you know, actually we're, we can understand things from a very basic nuts and bolts scientific perspective, very young. Children are incredibly smart. We get stupider as we get older, frankly. <laughs> as a former preschool teacher, I can say. Um, <laughs> we just do a better I, job of hiding our feelings, but I feel like we get less of, like we, our ability to actually communicate those feelings gets less accessible as we get older, unless we legitimately practice those things, right? Um, and then the traumas pile up and then it just becomes a whole mess. So I mean, if anything, yeah. sorry. If you're, shamed, if you're shamed for expressing feelings your entire life, you're gonna get worse at expressing them. Exactly, right? So um, so yeah, I just see, you know, these like beautiful little kids who are so good at expressing their feelings. They uh, vocalize their boundaries pretty uh, adamantly and loudly when needed. And I'm like, yes, good, vocalize those boundaries, right? Like, let's, let's work this out, you know? As a sex educator, um, I always think it's funny when people ask for my background, they're like, you used to teach preschool? And then you were a dancer and then you also taught sex ed and, you know, they look at my resume and they're like, what happened? I'm like, actually, I feel like it's pretty consistent because like at the end of the day, most of what I've ever done is asking people what their body needs, um, helping them figure out what their body needs physically, and then communicating what those needs are to me and also to themselves and also in a space that's safe for them to do that. Whether that is in the room with me dancing around with scarves or later on in a sex toy store holding some dildos and figuring out which one you would rather have. It honestly doesn't feel too different <laughs> to me. Yeah. I think the difference is we uh, have a huge stigma against sex in our culture. Correct. Correct. I really like the point you brought up earlier that people say, oh, these children are too young to learn about sex. But then you mentioned that some of your students have already been sexually assaulted. So they're not too young to have been assaulted. And if we don't give them comprehensive education or at least teach them the medical terms for things, we basically enable abusers because if a child doesn't have the words to say, oh, this adult was touching me in this place in a way that I didn't like, we're not going to be able to stop that from happening. Uh, I think a classic example is a preschooler telling a teacher that her uncle kept grabbing her cookie and she didn't like it. 
and the preschool teacher being like, well, you're supposed to share uh, your cookies with other people. Sharing is good. And then like a year later, and this being a repeated thing and a lesson in sharing. And then like a year later at a parent teacher conference, uh, the mom mentions like offhand, so, like off topic that she taught that she doesn't use the word vagina with her daughter. She calls that part of the body her cookie. And obviously that's a decently extreme example. Um, I, it is a real example, unfortunately. Right. It illustrates why we need to teach kids the medical terms for things. It illustrates why teaching kids about consent, about boundaries is so important. And like not teaching 14 year olds about sex will lead a bunch of 14 year olds to get pregnant. Yes. And, it, and that's the unfortunate thing is that I, you know, as a former preschool teacher, current sex educator, I see that through line from, hey, did you ask Timmy if he could, if you could jump on his back? No? Well, then why are you on top of him? Leads straight to, <laughs> did you ask Jane if she wanted you to touch her butt? No? Then why are you touching her butt? Mm-hmm. Right? And, you know, this is... <laughs> And it's like, sometimes I want to talk in that tone to you adults and being like, did you ask if you could do that to their body? No. Well, then keep your hands to yourself unless you ask and they say yes. And it seems like they want it. Right. And they have vocalized that to you in some either very verbal or very nonverbal, but enthusiastic way. Right. Um, And (laughs) sometimes I just want to have to take that preschool tone with them of like, (laughs) did you do this? No. Well, then why are you already doing it? (laughs) And it's, and it goes back to that very basic idea that if you're not taught consent from a young age, like I even just listening to that horrific story of that kid who even had the ability to vocalize that she was being harmed by her uncle, even just, even though she wasn't using the correct language, which is her mother's fault. Um, she even had the ability to vocalize that something was happening to her and it didn't feel good. And unfortunately, a lot of survivors of abuse and harm and trauma don't even get to that point, right? So it's like, not only do they not have the correct language, but there's a lot of, again, back to our shame conversation. There's a lot of, you know, silencing. There's a lot of um, internalization, right? So like, you know, you don't even feel like you can vocalize it. So you just kind of hold on to it and hold on to it and hold on to it. And it may not even come up until you're married or in therapy or maybe never, you know, I mean, who knows? So, um, but that stuff, you know, it follows us. All of these things follow us into adulthood. And so again, going back to my point of, I feel like a lot of what I do is harm reduction is that, you know, I feel like a lot of times people come to me and they've already experienced um, difficulty in their sensual or sexual lives, whether that means that they have experienced some kind of trauma or even just a regular, like I'm bored and I don't know how to, I don't know how to vocalize that I'm bored. Or I can't even tell you how many, you know, um, aside female at birth people have come to me after I've taught, you know, like a female ejaculation or, um, urethral sponge squirting workshop. And they've, said, I don't know that I've ever had an orgasm. I don't even know what that means. I don't know what that feels like. And that's happened several times in, you know, the years that I've taught. And I haven't been teaching for that many years. It's been since 2018-ish. And I've had like a good handful of people come up to me and be like, I don't know if I've had an orgasm. I don't know what that feels like. And just having that disconnection from their own bodies is such a, such an intense manifestation of the trauma that we have experienced, even if we haven't experienced an acute trauma, this is the collective societal shame-filled trauma that we have experienced, that we have been pushed to feel so disconnected from our bodies, that feeling embodied is not safe and feeling embodied in the sexual, um, feeling embodied in a sexual environment 
is not something that we're supposed to feel. So people might check out, people might just do it because they're bored or they are doing all the motions, they're replicating all the faces that one makes in a porno, but you're not actually in that space. You're not actually feeling the things that people are doing to you. So then of course you can't actually communicate what you want, right? Because who you may not even know what you want. And that's another issue that people come to me all the time saying, I don't know what I want, you know? I don't know what feels good. Cause that'll be a, a first question I'll have if I'm selling a toy to them or if I'm just asking them, if they say like, I'm bored or I'm unhappy in my sexual relationship. So I'd be like, okay, well, what, what do you do that feels good? Even if it's just to yourself, like what, it, what do you do when you masturbate that makes you feel good? And sometimes they'll be like, I don't know, I don't do it. Or they'll say like, well, I do this, but I think that's just cause that's what I'm supposed to do. Or I do this and it feels good, but then I can't replicate this with my partner. Mm -hmm because again, the communication piece isn't there, right? So then it, that goes back to that having to really break down, okay, what is your actual relationship with your sexual self? What does that look like? Who is that? What do they need? And then how do we communicate that to somebody else, right? So this piece isn't just about communication. And that's why I think it's so difficult to talk about this, that the trauma is so deep that it's like, even if you've never had acute sexual trauma in your life, which at this point is unfortunately, frankly, rare, but even if you've never had acute sexual trauma in your life, we all are sexually traumatized by the society that we grew up in because it is so riddled with shame and is so riddled with um, patriarchal, racist, colonialist eugenics and all of these issues that restrict not just access, like physical access to reproductive health care and reproductive autonomy, but also the autonomy of knowing ourselves, of knowing our sexual selves and what we actually want for our own bodies. Because that's a whole nother level of joy and pleasure that gets capped, that gets cut off. And unless we really do the healing work to like dig in and find access to that, if we can even do that, right? After we do all the healing trauma-informed work, if we can get to that, then we can be like, okay, this is what I would like. Touch my clitoris. And even just saying that is so hard, right? For so many people. And then saying, how do you want me to touch your clitoris? And then it's like, okay, now we have to figure out what that even could look like, what that even could feel like. You know, and it's, it's I'm on a little bit of a rant here, a ramble, but... Um, it's okay. The Patreons always get the extended interview. Great. Fantastic. <laughs> but that's the, I mean, that's the extent of the damage here. So, you know, I'm, I'm going back to your original um, nihilistic question of, is it really that bad? And the answer is yes, it is really that bad because uh, the damage is already done and it's pretty deep. Um, and it's so much deeper than just the physical access, the uh, the monetary access, the educational access. It is deep embedded societal, ancestral, inherited trauma that we are having to face, unpack, work through and heal. And it is a lot of work. Yeah, thank you for that. Um... <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't wanna call it like, I guess, uh, thank you for that TED talk. <laughs> um, <Sure. laughs> at one point I should stop feeling rage. I just haven't yet. It's no, it's um, fine. Have you read, um, good and mad by Re Rebecca Traster yet? No, I would highly recommend that, once you're done with this, like maybe listening to it on an audiobook or something. I mean, if you want to read it, you can, but I, I listened to it and I found it really cathartic to listen to, but it's basically like, you're allowed to be angry just be mad and it's okay. And it's, it's very good. I highly recommend. Uh, so last question uh, for the day, when it comes to the abortion debate, a lot of terms are used that aren't necessarily scientific terms. Uh, for example, uh, terms like fetal heartbeat or late term abortion or potential life, I believe is the legal term that was used in all three opinions, Roe v. Wade, Planned Parenthood uh, versus Casey and Dobbs, the new one. Uh, 
all three of those opinions use the term potential life. And of course, the media uses terms like late term abortion, which isn't a real medical term. And I actually tried to look up a definition for it. And I found four different definitions ranging from uh, last few weeks of the pregnancy to like anything after the halfway point and like everything in between. Uh, and uh, also the term like fetal heartbeat. Why do you think terms like that exist? Uh, and, or why do you think terms like that are so widely used and widely circulated when they are misleading? Uh, late term abortion has no fixed definition. Uh, fetal heartbeat is misleading because while there is cardiac activity, there's no heart yet. Like the heart hasn't even started forming when the quote unquote fetal heartbeat is detected. And uh, potential life is kind of this wibbly wobbly, like not really, it's theoretical life. It's not scientific. I mean, I think it's kind of a simple answer, which is that they use buzzwords, right? And I think the former presidency to the, our current one is a perfect example of the fact that using very unscientific and very often inarticulate buzzwords um, are a lot more eye-catching or ear-catching, I guess <laughs> might be a better term than using actual scientific, well-researched, articulated language. The unfortunate fact of the matter is that most people that are talking about abortion and reproductive health care don't even have uteruses or vaginas, let alone any background in science or scientific knowledge. And that goes back to our you know, failed educational systems <laughs> and lack of um, sexual health uh, education, right? So we have all these people who probably never even got any kind of sex education growing up, probably had no real health education class other than don't have sex, don't get an STI. And, uh, yeah, yeah, right. You will, you will get pregnant, you will die, you will get cancer, you will die, you know, a, not even a correct, there isn't even a correct nutritional <laughs> pyramid that has existed that people we have actually been talk given. about that in our this video is going to have a lot of I think overlap with our fat phobia video mm. uh, about how just kind of our changing definitions of what is like morally correct mm -hmm. and the fat phobia video is all about how our kind of morals impact medicine and bias in medicine based mm -hmm. on like puritanical and racist standards. Correct. Uh, and why a bunch of doctors are like, yeah, being overweight is actually really helpful for like all these heart conditions and being at the low end of a healthy weight can actually be pretty dangerous to your health because it means you don't have enough body fat to like handle certain common illnesses and they can affect you way worse. It's like, well, if, it's, if it poses health risks, how is it a healthy weight? Right, exactly. Like, and I mean, and talking about abortion or talking about, um, sorry, talking about contraceptive access, if you are over a certain weight, the, you know, morning after pill or plan B pill may not be useful for you. Mm -hmm. So again, there is already in, in the already incredibly restricted uh, preventative care for pregnancy, um, even within that for folks with uteruses and vaginas. You can't, you have to be under a certain weight. You have to be able to pay the $60 out of pocket. You have to be able to do all these things within 72 hours of having um, unprotected sex to even be able to have access to that specific brand of preventative care. In some states, you have to be over a certain age. Exactly. So there are so many, yeah, there are so many overlaps. And again, this goes back to exactly what you're saying, the patriarchal racist um, you know, bizarre, idealized, healthy, whatever. And, you know, most doctors don't get actual nutritional um, training. So again, even people in the healthcare world don't actually know what they're talking about when it comes to <laughs> very basic body things like nutrition, like 
periods, you know, and that is oftentimes what people are dealing with when they're just dealing with stuff like a messy period schedule is maybe their, you know, maybe their nutritional balances are off. Maybe their hormones a little bit off and a very basic comprehensive understanding of what those could mean could prevent a whole host of diagnostic tests that could save you a lot of money. But unfortunately, a lot of our healthcare providers are not trained to know about those things or to understand any of those things. So yes, it's all very much interlinked. So I guess scary follow-up. Because the term potential life is currently being used to distinguish uh, the opinion on abortion from potential opinions on gay marriage, interracial marriage, um, and other non-enumerated rights protected by the 14th Amendment, uh, ostensibly based on other precedents, I am a little nervous that the potential life argument could be applied to something like contraceptives, uh, mainly because there are some politicians who say the quiet part out loud and are worried that fertility rates will go down if people have access to contraceptives. Yeah. I mean, that's why certain, you know, religious sects will, will not believe or engage in contraceptives with sex because they believe that it's all in their higher power, their God's hands as to whether or not they will get pregnant. So you know, unfortunately, that is a very real problem that we have and still continue to deal with is that there are, you know, religious, um, religious beliefs that are deeply embedded in our political systems that do link it all the way back to contraceptives and even sometimes before that to masturbation, you know. And I think we should be very clear that uh, if any religious couples want to not use birth control, leave it all to the hands of their higher power. That is all well and good for them. That is their choice and completely, we're so glad they're living their truth. Do your thing, um, don't do your thing. Totally fine, just don't tell me what to do with my thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, like it reminds me of the, you know, the shaker um, religion. I don't know if you're familiar with them at all, but. I have heard of them and I, I got a very basic yeah. one of them in the religions unit of my middle school history <laughs> class. Um, so the Shakers were kind of similar to the Quakers in that they were a very um, pious religious sect of Christianity. They were actually founded by a woman who was a victim of domestic violence. And so she believed that any interaction between men and women would inevitably lead to sin because she believed that she was a victim of her husband's sinful animalistic tendencies to abuse her. And there's just no, she, I, she must've been incredibly fatalistic. She was like, there's just no way that men and women can interact in any kind of healthy way. That seems if they're like in, like men are trash way too far. You know, she did. And <laughs> I mean, like power to her, uh, she kept herself safe. Um, but then they created this whole religious sect where men and women lived completely separately all the time. If they, the only times they would come together would be in church and the men would sit on one side and the women would sit on the other side and they would physically shake out their sins with their bodies. They would physically dance and sing and shake out their sins and then they would feel better. And then they would go back to making their gorgeous, you know, boxes and their beautiful staircases. Um, the furniture was immaculate um, because what else were they going to do with their time? Um, <laughs> and they didn't have sex. Nobody had sex. Well, at least nobody was allowed to have sex. It was not a thing that you were allowed to do. So in order to maintain their societies, they would have to adopt children from other places to keep going, which is why uh, there is no actual active shaker community anymore because it wasn't a sustainable community because they kept running out of kids, right? There are only so many children they could acquire from outside places at the time. This is, you know, 18 to early 1900s, right? So yeah, so it, it just wasn't sustainable, but- well, it seems entirely unsustainable. <laughs> and it, but I think this is just Where a really extreme- up? <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I mean, like, like, I'm sure there can be whole conversations around like queerness and, you know, like what kind of really sexy shit happened that was, you know, not, uh, not hetero. Uh, <laughs> what happened in those uh, women only other than those men only buildings? I guess only God's eyes know. I'm just saying um, a bunch of women getting together, building furniture. <laughs> Some of them were probably wearing tool belts. You know, I, if, if there are whole, you know, whole adult uh, media uh, produced from that fantasy, I'm, I wouldn't not say I would watch it. Yeah, I, I'm just going to go do a quick Google search. <laughs> <laughs> marking a few tabs. <laughs> So that's a lovely thought. And I, that's how I like, and it's like, all oh, these poor people, they just had such boring lives. I'm like, you know what? I just hope they made beautiful boxes that had lots of gay sex is like what my brain is going to. You know, I think that that is just kind of uh, very exemplary of what happens when we get these incredibly shame-filled puritanical things in our heads, right? That it's like, well, then we just can't interact. Yeah, I mean, then we just won't, but it's like, that's not how it works, right? We don't all live in these like cute little farmhouses in the middle of nowhere. Um, and that's also not how we want to live. And that's also not how, I mean, a lot of people want to live. I mean, if you do go do your thing, go live in that beautiful little shaker house in the middle of nowhere, but a lot of people don't live like that. And so we have to find ways of communicating in safe and healthy and effective ways. Um, and, you know, going back to the potential life thing, it's like, yeah, we, we have to actually know what we're talking about when we're talking about scientific knowledge. And we have to know what we're talking about when we're talking about what we are and are not allowing people to have access to. And what we do and what we say makes a difference. That's the whole, that, those are all my questions. Amazing. Is there, is there anything else you would like to say that you think uh, either to someone who's watching this video who might be uh, worried about their own future, like someone who may become pregnant, uh, someone who is pregnant and doesn't want to be. Um, do you have any advice uh, specifically about abortion uh, and about uh, what to do if you're someone uh, who really cares about this issue? Uh, or is worried about how this issue might affect them. Do you have any advice uh, to share with them? Um, yeah, I would say my first piece of advice is read feminist Black literature, read feminist Black theor theoretical works. Black feminists and womanists have been doing this kind of work for a really, really long time. Um, follow people like Adrienne Marie Brown, follow people who have been doing this kind of boots on the ground grass work community care for a long time who know that the state is not going to take care of all of us and that has been a thing for a long time for underserviced populations and will continue to be a problem i think whenever i whenever i feel really despondent i turn to black feminist activists um, black intersectional writing and see that this is a very long history of struggle and at the end of the day the answer is community care and there will always be community care because it's always unfortunately been needed so just know that there are people out there who will take care of you you know I mean just a little piece of local history Jane was in an underground uh, abortion care practice in the Chicagoland area where it was like a, it was a, a word, a code word. You could call this particular number and say, hi, I'm looking for Jane or whatever else you would say. And you would say Jane. And as soon as they heard the name Jane, they knew that you were looking to get an abortion and they would hook you up with, a, it's usually a woman who was trained by a doctor to perform an abortion. And it was done as safely and healthfully as possible. And that has led to programming like the Chicago Women's Health Center and things like that, that give um, access to folks who don't have the money to pay for reproductive health services or education. So, you know, there, 
there's a very long history of community care and reproductive access. <clears throat> I did an abortion companion training. So there are folks out there who like, if you need any kind of reproductive health care done, um, whether it's going to get an abortion or, you know, say you've had medical trauma or you've had um, an unpleasant gynecological experience and you want someone there to hold your hand, there are people out there who will go with you to your doctor's appointment, who will sit there and hold your hand, who will make you a cup of tea once you've gotten your IUD removed or inserted if you need to. So I would say that you're not alone and making people feel like they're alone is often what has caused these kinds of patriarchal racist societies to thrive in that we feel like we're alone and we don't have anyone who will take care of us. And it's like, we have to take care of each other. So do what you can to take care of yourself and also figure out ways that you can show up for somebody else, whether that means do one of those kinds of trainings. See if you can volunteer at a local clinic. Uh, if you want to be uh, either an abortion companion or you could be an escort to help people get to their appointments safely. There are all kinds of groups on social media to uh, be kind of like an Airbnb or to be a- um, I was actually going to mention practical yeah. access funds. Yeah. So in addition to reproductive rights organizations, there are also reproductive justice organizations. Correct. Uh, there are several uh, in and around Chicago uh, and throughout the US. There are actually many all over the world. But uh, even though in Illinois, we have comprehensive reproductive health care, however, just like every medical procedure in America, if you don't have insurance, uh, if you can't get child care or time off work or uh, can't afford to travel to it, it is going to be much harder to access. Mm -hmm. So a practical access fund uh, that you can donate to, volunteer for, or uh, provide resources for in some other way is designed to help uh, pregnant people who don't want to be pregnant uh, figure out child care. Um, the majority of people who get abortions already have children. Figure out uh, travel expenses, whether that means driving over a state border or just driving a few hours to the nearest clinic that will perform an abortion or driving a few hours to the nearest clinic that's or driving a few hours to the nearest clinic that is approved to give you the two pills you need uh, to have an abortion um, and having a place to stay for the night, um, being able to afford the procedure, all of those things you can also help with. Reminder that abortion is still legal in America until, this, this, until the final draft of the decision comes out. Even when that opinion is published, abortion will still be legal in a lot of states, including Illinois, uh, for all of you in the Midwest, and including Indiana, surprisingly. Uh, Indiana does not have a law on the books protecting abortion like Illinois does, but Indiana, is one of the only Midwestern states without a trigger law, which I found very interesting. I didn't know that. That is yeah. fascinating. But if you're in Indiana and can't afford to get to a clinic, that doesn't matter. So uh, I highly encourage everyone to donate money, time, any skills you have. Uh, you can sign up to be a driver if someone needs to fly in for an abortion. Uh, even now that happens because of uh, six week cardiac activity laws. So like even now you can really help a lot of people. Yep. Even just like, even if you're not like a, you know a trained abortion companion or whatever even if you can just be like, hey, I'm here. If you need to talk, if you wanna go get some coffee you know, just offering to be a, a safe ear I think is a really, a really good way to show up for, for each other right now. You know, like if you just need to rage rant to a fellow uterus owner about all of these things, you know, I think there is a lot of healing that can come from rage. There's a lot of healing that can come from affirmation and validation of our feelings right now. So, you know, I, I get that if you need to just hide and turn off the news 
and just kind of cocoon your own little space here and there. Self-care is important. Self-care is very important. Um, but also if you know that you need community, either for yourself or, you know, somebody around you needs community in that way, showing up for each other is one of the best things we can do right now. And I'll have a list of like funds and things people can donate to or volunteer for in the description. Yeah. I mean, you can always, um, you know, check out your local sex educator, <laughs> check out your local sex um, feminist adult toy shop to get condoms, to get dental dams, um, to get pleasure tools. Um, if you need to rage masturbate, that's totally valid. Um, <laughs> You know, you can reach out to anyone if you need to talk, if you have any questions. Um, like I said, I'm a counselor in training, so I'm offering discounted counseling uh, sessions right now. So, you know, there are lots of, there are lots of resources out there that you can, that you can have access to if you want, like, if you don't want to dump on your friends and you want someone who's a little bit more of a professional to kind of hold that space for you, there's, there's definitely stuff out there. Yeah. And I'll put links to uh, Meryl's uh, website where you can see everything that they do from uh, yoga classes to sex education, to dance classes, to Reiki, that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. To the sky, to the sky.